Welcome to Bright Divinity School's Borderlands Institute Fall Webinar Series on the theme of Responsibility and Immigration. My name is Francisco Losada Jr. and I am the Director of the Borderlands Institute at Bright Divinity School. We are very excited about this series and especially grateful to the Henry Luce Foundation for Technology for making this event possible. I would like to add that all webinar events are recorded. You can find them on Bright's YouTube page. Today's event will be posted in a few days. Briefly, for those who are new, this webinar series aims to bring awareness to the very complex issues around immigration and, and aspires to make a modest contribution to hear through the voices of vulnerable migrants new narratives to these issues. We have discussed so far xenophobia and migration, children and migration, gender and sexuality migration, and today climate-driven migration. We are also mindful that the United Nations COP26 Climate Summit is taking place in Glasgow, Scotland. Our distinguished presenter today is journalist Todd Miller. Todd has researched and written about border issues for over 15 years. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Tom Dispatch, The Nation, San Francisco Chronicle, and numerous other publications. He has also written several books, all related to the complex and multifaceted faceted issue of migration. On a personal note, I have been reading Todd's article and books over the years and have found his work, his writing not only informative, but transformative. So I'm very excited to have Todd here today. Today's presentation is entitled Storming the Wall, Climate Change, Displacement and Borders. As the pr presentation begins, feel free to begin submitting questions in the chat room. We will try our best to address them at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, join me with a virtual clap and welcoming journalist Todd Miller. The stage is now yours, Todd, thank you. Th thank you so much, Francisco. It's really an honor to be here speaking with you, speaking here with the Bright Divinity School and um and with with everyone present so many thanks for the invitation and organizing this um the the title of the presentation is storming the wall um that title comes from my uh 2017 book uh um with by the same title storming the wall and the subtitle is a little different Clim climate change uh migration and homeland security is its subtitle of the of the book, but I like the subtitle of the talk better. I think it's more more appropriate for what we're going to, going to be talking about today. So I'm going to be basing this on on, on this book, but updating it as well. So I'll, I'll be adding some updates to to the research, and I'll bring in some other research that's been done uh, since then that adds to the analysis, including a report that just came out right for the, the COP26, like Francisco just mentioned, uh, that's going on in Glasgow in this in this moment. And it's called the, the Global Climate Wall. So it, it goes into, um, it, it, for, it, 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 it um, goes deeper into the analysis. Um, but anyhow, it's, it's a great to be here. I think the best way to start is um, to go, Right to the beginning of the book storming the wall and uh at the beginning of the book um i well actually i want to tell you the story of how i came to write the part of the, that is the beginning of the book and so storming the wall um is a book that where i do i do um go i try to connect the dots between displacement climate change climate change displacement and borders and I do that by looking at going to many different places around the world um, with a with a with a focus on the US Mexico border for sure. But I also go to um, different places like the Philippines, which I'm about to mention right now. Uh, the I got I went to the 2015 Paris COP, the climate summit, and I also went to Central America. So I'm gonna to touch on all those those places. Um, 
as I speak. And I and and the the style of the presentation is going to mimic sort of the style of the book and it's more storytelling but storytelling like reportage style journalism. So storytelling to illustrate bigger points and the bigger points where I'll weave in the analysis and um, some data and statistics. But anyhow, I wanted to start in the Philippines and the Philippines was a was a particularly special place for me to um, to go to research, do research for this book, primarily because my grandmother is from the Philippines and I went to the island where she is from was um, called Marinduque, which is uh, right in kind of the center of the 7,000 islands of the Philippines. And when I was there, I met with um, the, the province of Marinduque's uh, disaster specialist. <laughs> and they, they actually have somebody who focuses on disaster who, who had just come out with a report, a report looking at what was going to happen on the island in 2050. And one and among many things that he mentioned, one of the one of the biggest concerns was sea level rise. And he and he and he mentioned a place on the island that I could I could go to and see it for myself. So the next day I went. Um, I was walking along the beach, and I came uh, I came up to a house, and this house there was well I should I should back up a step. There was an actual typhoon going on in the Philippines, but way, 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 way in the north. So it was pretty far away from Marinduque, but it was a, it was big enough that the sky was gray and there was a, a small storm surge and it was spitting rain. Mm -hmm. And so when I came up to this house, even with the small storm surge, I was the waves are going in, lapping in and out of the house. That I and I, when I further. Uh, more closely examined the house, it was as obvious the house was half destroyed. It was like a corpse that a remnant that was just there, um, sitting there on the beach, but the house was destroyed. And I, I mentioned that because that that day, and it was 2015, that was the first time I saw with my own, you know, my own eyes, what I knew was something that had been destroyed by uh, a dynamic caused by climate change. And so the that whole concept of the idea of climate change for me personally in that moment went from something that was abstract to something very raw, real, very present. And um, right after that, I, ended, I talked with a fisherman who was a little bit further past the house from the community of Balogo that was nearby. This house was a part of that community. And I, we started talking about the sea level rise, and he pointed to a buoy, which is about 15 feet out. It was kind of rocking in the sea. And he said the shoreline used to be there. That's where the shoreline was, around where that buoy um, was. And he said that the sea had been moving in, moving in, moving in gradually for now years. And, um, and it was after I talked with the fisherman that a young man came out carrying a child. And the child was in his arms. And I still remember the, the child had, uh, um, his hair was blowing, blowing in the wind from the storm. And it was that moment I, that I, I started, I, 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 I went off to the side and just started writing in my notebooks everything that I'd heard and, and was seeing. And um, I really started to concentrate on that child, right? Like the, the fishermen, for example, told me they had already moved the community back right there and so the, some of the houses in the community they could actually move back because the sea sea level had come in so i started thinking about the child who i guessed was one or two years old and mind you you know not only was i on the island of my grandmother which had that spot a more that profound effect on me thinking that my grandmother's island was being swallowed by the sea but also i was you know, I was, I was, my first child was five months away. So I was really thinking in terms of really going back to the past and then also into the future generations. And so when I saw that child, I was, it was very intense. I started thinking and writing in my notebook, wondering what it would be like for that child in 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, would they have to move the community back further? 
would they would the salt water get in the irrigation for the rice fields would um would uh they just have to abandon the community altogether would it become an uninhabitable would that child in his future have to move be forced to move be forced to to relocate would that child have to go to boac which is the capital of marinduque or manila the capital of the philippines or would that child have to go across borders and if that child didn't have the correct papers to go across borders well then what he would be facing is what we'll be discussing here today, which is the, which is the border regime. So I was, I was thinking, so that's the meditation. Um, I, when I was in the Philippines, I went to other places, a number of other places, but that was really um, one of the first times for me. And, and on hindsight now, I probably saw impacts of climate change for a long time before that, but what it really became impactful for me and that, and it was that it was it was really that scene that became the first scene of storming the wall, and um, and also just all the stuff that I learned there was um, it was a glimpse as well into the future, right? A glimpse into the future that of um, climate, uh, looking what scientists are saying or is going to happen in climate change, including sea level rise. I went to Tacloban, where a massive hurricane. Uh, if there's category six, the cat it would Typhoon Haiyan was the strongest typhoon ever to make landfall at the time, and destroyed ten uh, over a million or over a million people were displaced, and um, about more than ten thousand people were killed. So that that typhoon, that sea level rise, are just two glimpses into what scientists are saying in a in a, a status quo world is what we're going, what, what is it, what, what awaits us in the future. And alongside that, um, as scientists and others are looking at displacement, um, a type of displacement and the movement of people unlike we have ever seen before in human history. And so from there, from the Philippines, I want to turn to another place where I went as part of this research, and that's Central America. Um, one of the places I went to was, well, I went primarily to Honduras and Guatemala, but I also spent time on the Chiapas Guatemala border. And one of the places I went to was a, a town called Tenosique. Tenosique is about 20 miles from the border with Guatemala in the state of Tabasco. It's not, it's close to Chiapas, but it's the state of Tabasco. And I was in, I was there, I was staying three, day, three days there in a, in a shelter, in a migrant, in a shelter for migrants. And during my time there, I would go out to the train yard. And the train yard, of course, is a place where people would get on the train, often to go north to the United States. So when I was there on my second day, I, went to the train yard and I ended up talking to these three small farmers from Honduras. And they told me that they were headed to the United States. They told me that they had been there for six days. They told me that the night before they tried to hop on a train, but the train was going too fast. And mind you, that's a tactic that um, the Mexican government started to use around that time. I, again, I'm talking around 2015. Um, and the, actually, I was looking into Mexico's buildup of its border uh, with Guatemala rather um, more than climate displacement at the moment that I was interviewing these three farmers. Uh, but um, but uh, so I and looking at U.S. pressure, but we could talk about that in the discussion if you'd like to, um, uh, because that's also very important to the story. But anyhow, I ta in talking to the three three farmers they they told me that um they started to talk about why they left to begin with and one of the farmers said there was no rain and with no rain there was no harvest with there's no harvest there was no food with no, no food there was a crisis and that crisis was the reason why they left their community and that's the reason why they were in Tenosique. and so later i doing research i found out that they lived their community was near Copan for people who know, kind of near the Honduran Guatemalan border, where there's a uh, archaeological site, 
um, in Copan. That area is, the, is known as a dry corridor. And the dry corridor is an area that extends from Guatemala, actually even Southern Mexico through Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, where there has been more drought, where the rains or the weather has been less predictable, where the seasons are scrambling, where, um, where when farmers plant their seeds, sometimes the rains don't come. And that's exactly what happened in that year in 2015. In fact, the research showed in that year, 400,000 farmer, 4,000, 4, I should say 400,000 families in Honduras were really directly affected by that drought so much that the government even did a meager food assistance program and a, about a million people throughout all Central America. And it, and it, and it you know, as I, when, you know, when I found, when I researched this further, I was like, wow, I wonder how many other people that were in that train yard or in Tenosique were in that same sort of predicament, right? And, and a, a mayor from a town nearby where they live called it a calamity, right? Uh, using those sorts of words, a calamity. The, the word of famine is used quite a bit as well. Um, and, uh, and really to update this a little bit, because because to show that, well, for, first I should say, when I did talk to climate scientists that were doing modeling in this area, they were saying, yes, this is intensifying. These droughts are intensifying. These events of no rain or extreme rain, they're both happening. And, um, and the model says in a status quo, in business as usual, it's just going to keep increasing like this. And that has... And that has played out. Um, uh, 2018 was hit was a particularly bad year as far as drought is concerned in Central America. Um, so much at the end of the year, the w World Food Program uh, calculated that 2.4 million people in in particularly the dry corridor were were suffering hunger. 2.4 million people at the end of 2018. 2020 also plagued with droughts coming up to, to the end of the year. And then at the end of the year, two, and I'm sure many people know about this, two very strong hurricanes hit the Honduran and Nicaraguan coasts about exactly one year ago in November. And those hurricanes left devastation, um, a wake of devastation that extended in, well into Guatemala, in fact, um, one picture that remains in my mind is a town that was flooded and the flood, the flood line was so high that only a church steeple stood out. And in that particular town, 600 people lost their homes, 600 families, I should say, lost their homes and livelihoods. Um, and that's just one example. Um, according to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, when that it's a it's an international organization that looks at displacement um in different countries if they looking at disaster displacement in honduras and guatemala in 2020 they calculated that 1.3 million people were displaced in just those two countries um the world food program again remember they did the one they said 2.4 million at the end of 2018 were suffering hunger that number according to a survey and um, report that they put out in January of 2021, went up to 8 million, 8 million people. So that's almost, what is that? That's almost triple um, in just two years. So you have the drought compounded by the hur by the hurricanes, compounded by COVID, right? They had the, the, the pandemic and the impacts of the pandemic. And another thing that they, they mentioned, the World Food Program, is at the end of 2018, they did a survey asking people who, about concrete plans to migrate. And 8% of people they surveyed in 2018 said they were. And then by um, 2021, that number, that percentage almost doubled to 15%. So um, just just looking at the last five five years since I was there in Tenosique in 2015, you can you could see this, these phenomenon intensifying, even Customs and Border Protection, uh, looking at its da data, 
um, our, our, um, they had a press conference in 2018 where they said, well, people are coming from these areas that are suffering drought. They don't mention climate change, but in, in at least in that press conference, but they were, they were, they were, they were showing that there were the data that they got from people that they arrested at the U S Mexico border was showing that people are coming from these areas. Um, now, mind you, when you're talking about climate displacement, right? Um, it's difficult to parse that out. And uh, there's, I like to look at the framing uh, that sociologist Christian Parenti um, uh, kind of coined in his book, Tropic of Chaos, which looks at climate change as well. And he calls it the catastrophic convergence. So it's a framing that where you have different issues, whether they be political, economic, social, issues of security, right? All these things that you see in Central America. And uh, there's an increase, instead of being siloed, he says that they're a convergence, right? And there's an, there's a, an ecological element that that's, is becoming increasingly part of this convergence that's directly related to climate change. And so these, all these things converge into one. And that's, you know, that's how you, it's to look at the displacement or why people, for example, if somebody's economically marginalized in a place like Guatemala where a subsistence farmer who has very little cash, if the harvest wilt, then, and you have no cash to back on, and no, no, any, you don't have another alternative that you're putting almost, you're put into, a, you're put into a crisis, right? And there's a, a variety of different reasons for it. And then that often, and part of that, that crisis, then do you go to a city in another city within the country, like Guatemala City, or do you go across the border? You know, those sorts of decisions are made. But usually when the, at the at, you know, when the crisis hits or so, but anyhow, the point, the point is, is that there's lots of factors that are often involved in this. But for our purposes today, we're, of course, we're trying to look at climate. So that's what we're doing. And so it's it's good to do to to do our best and trying to figure out, you know, how much this is impacting people displacement and then people moving and then internal migration within countries and also extra across border migration. And according to the also the internal displacement monitoring center on a global level, um, and they're looking from 2008 to present. There's been an average of 25 million people per year um, who have been displaced due to disaster. And while you have to have nuance because, you know, as everyone says, you know, it's difficult to say, oh, this event was caused exclusively by climate change. What they do say is that these events are definitely impacted by climate change or intensifying. They're becoming more frequent. They're becoming stronger. You know, even like hurricanes with more precip even hurricanes that are category one, but are packed with precipitation. They're all these these sorts of things are coming becoming more common. And so um, so so those sorts of those are the numbers that the internal displacement monitoring center has. And they say that their ability to calculate slow onset disasters, meaning like droughts that happen year after year after year like that desert a desertification process which were which leaves places maybe even uninhabitable those sorts of calculations they say are difficult for them and so the numbers might even be higher than that and on top of that there's the projections right the projections going uh into the future um the projections are widely debated um they range from a World Bank report that just came out in September, looking at six different regions around the world, calculated that 216 million people would be displaced by 2050 in six regions, not the whole world. Um, another report that came out in 2020 had that number as a potential 1.2 billion. So you can see the range of, of future projections are are wide and one of the reasons why it's the future right you're talking about the future the future is unknown it's it's an x factor we don't know there's many things that could be changed right uh, there's many things that can happen that such features would uh might not happen um so that's that's definitely one reason but the but as um one of the 
one of the researchers and a researcher from the United Nations who I interviewed in Storming the Wall, she, Coco Warner is, is her name. She told me that, um, and, and she was a part of the research for one of the first empirical studies linking climate change with, with displacement and migration called In, in Search of, Sh of Shelter. She told me that in a, in a business as usual, um, what if things stay the same, what we will see will be staggering, quote unquote staggering, and without precedent in human history as far as people on the move. So with that, I want to turn to, to borders, the idea of the border. Um, the border is, so you, so one, one thing to mention is that, um, while, um, the, there's projections showing clearly that, that these numbers are on the rise, there's very, very little talk about any sort of refugee status. The, of course, the convention on refugees, it does not mention any, it doesn't have anything to do with anything to do with the environmental environmentally caused migration um it's about persecution so the the definitions do not encompass this nor does it encompass economic rea um issues that people have and it's an issue that's even though the biden administration did just put out a report looking it's the first time ever that i'd seen anything from like this from the white house or even from the u.s federal government that links climate and migration and displacement. It doesn't have anything necessarily. They talk about potential refugee status, nothing serious, nothing binding. And as far as as far as discussion is, is, is so there's there's little discussion like within Congress um, about these issues. So at least how it stands. And I was surprised actually when I was doing the research for storming the wall and talking to people and experts on this. And I was expecting in a, at an international level, level to hear that, well, climate status might be nearby or their discussions might be more advanced than I thought. And there was pessimism almost everywhere, you know, that at the at the least like 10 years, you know, 10 years away is what, what one person told me. Um, so, that said, and that again, that can change. Um, if people, if somebody is displaced by, by a hurricane, a flood, a drought, and they come across the border and they don't have papers, what they what they're going to face is a border regime, and um, and the border, there's a you can look at the borders in many different ways. Um, I'll talk about the U.S. border here in a second, but I do want to make a make a point about the global border panorama and, and if you just look at border walls right in 1989 when the berlin wall fell there were 15 border walls around the world and now there are more than 70. two-thirds of those were built after 9 11. my point with this is to show that we are seeing a more bordered world every day across the globe and if you look where these border walls are being built they they're being built loosely to lose uh, between the global north and global south loosely between places that are being more impacted by climate having more displacement and those that um um those and those the high emitting co uh, countries like the united states or or countries in the european union who have put lots of greenhouse gas emissions um, are, are often the, on the other side, the ones building the border walls. Um, so uh, in, the, in terms of to look at how, how much this border, the kind of border regimes have, have increased, just looking at the United States, for example, looking at it, if you look at 1994, I like to use 1994 because the deterrence strategy on the US-Mexico border was implemented that year with a number of operations like Operation Gatekeeper, Operation Hold the Line. And that strategy is still in place today. And that's a strategy of building up um, uh, the fortification in cities, uh, traditional cities where people cross, and then forcing people to circumvent those cities if they wanna cross. 
and the deterrence would be like the desert in Arizona where I live. Um, and so when, when this deterrence strategy was implemented in 1994, um, the budget for border and immigration enforcement in the United States was $1.5 billion with the immigration and naturalization service. Um, that budget has grown usually if I'm in, in, in during an in-person uh, talk, I will ask people, you know, how much do you think the border, that budget has grown? And the, put it this way, just to give you a hint, it's, it's dramatic and it's historic and never has it grown like it has in the last two decades. So when Joe Biden took office in 2021, the budget for customs and border protection and ICE, if you, CBP and ICE, if you put them together, is, uh, was $25 billion. And so year after year after year after year, these budgets have gone up and up and up and up and up and manifesting in, you know, nearly 700 miles of walls and barriers, billions and billions of dollars of technologies, um, including drone systems, 12,000 uh, implanted motion sensors, surveillance systems, um, uh, aerostats, which are like sur surveillance balloons with, with cameras. And also the border patrol went from 4,000 to 21,000 uh, by 2012 and still maintained around that level of 21, 20 to 21,000 since then. And so this, it's just, it's, it's a, it's showing this, this um, massive increase that we're seeing in the United States, of course, but this is global. It's a global increase. There's more walls, there's more border patrols, there's more surveillance technologies um, all around the world. And so the argument that I make in the book, um, oh, and, and another thing, as you think about projections, like the projection for climate displacement to go from say to 216 million, like the World Bank says in 2040, there's also projections in terms of the border like there's a border market of industries that sell from walls to, to surveillance technologies and there's forecasts and the forecast for homeland security and mind you when i wrote my first book about this called border patrol nation in 2014 the forecast was around 300 billion dollars which is a lot but now the forecasts are exceeding 900 billion dollars for like 2025 2026 and i'm talking about a homeland security market right and that this is the market that that where companies feel they can sell to border for border. I mean, among other things, but a lot of it goes into border, border and immigration enforcement. And so that's one way you can look at how, you know, a projection for this, this kind of apparatus to be increasing, which also should be interpreted as this is how rich countries, the historic high emitting countries are responding to climate change by building walls, right? Um, and so how, with that said, and I'm, I'm going to try to wind, you know, wind, uh, finish the talk so we can have plenty of time for discussion. I do want to read how, how does this connect? Are there connections and there are direct connections and one, one, uh, little passage I want to read from Storm, um, that comes from, actually it's, for, I wrote about it in Storming the Wall, but it comes from a report called an abrupt climate change scenario and it, it and its implications for United States um, national security that uh, was a 2003 report that was commissioned by the Pentagon and they write the United States and Australia are likely to build defensive fortresses around their countries because they have the resources and reserves to achieve self-sufficiency and then it says borders will be strengthened around the country to hold back Unwanted starving immigrants, that's this is a direct quote, Unwan unwanted starving immigrants from the Caribbean islands, and especially severe problem, and they put that in parentheses, Mexico and South America. And I assume they mean Central America. Um, it's possible that they were that they were geographically challenged the the assessors. Um, but, uh, but that's so those that assessment is just one of many assessments they become more polished over the years but all of them say the same thing including one in 2021 um uh, that you can look up from the national intelligence directorate look look at how 
um, migration due to climate change is framed. They mentioned Central America, the national, this is from the United States government, the, the National Intelligence Directorate, um, uh, they say, they use the word migration 18 times. It's characterized as, as, as a threat. It's what it's often put in the framing of a threat multiplier. And then if you look at some of the DHS documents, Department of Homeland Security, they follow that threat the kind of the threat multiplier migration as a threat migration as a threat to instability to then say we will prepare our borders for mass migrations we will prepare our borders for this so the dhs has two separate climate action plans now you can look them up um they they talk about the historic the mission of department of Homes, homeland security and they look at climate through that framing border border enforcement immigration enforcement counterterrorism cybersecurity and um, internal infrastructure. So a lot of the emphasis is put on, you know, they even mention, you know, what's going on in Central America and the droughts. And so so there's a, a definite connections between border building, looking into the future, looking into these projections, looking at migration as a threat and the response of that being building up our border systems. One last thing I wanna mention before we go into discussion, is um, that, again, as I said earlier, this is a lot of what this is, although a lot of this is happening in the present and it's happened, it's also future, right? And it's an X factor. And one of the things that happened when I was researching Storming the Wall, when I doing research for other books, when I go and talk to people around the world around these issues, there's so many things being done. and. You could, you could read, I could write an alternative book that would be as tall as my ceiling that would, that, that would, you know, have all these different things that people are doing around the world. And I always wonder, you know, if all this was coordinated um, and put together, that it would be, that's why I think a good catalog of that to see how many things people are doing would be um, uh, amazing. But one thing that I saw, and I, and I just want to end with this was, a binational project, a water harvesting project on the on the U.S. Mexico border, just uh, east of Agua Prieta, and I went there um, to see this binational water harvesting project. But the people first showed me; they took me out to where they were doing it. But they showed me how the border wall. You now there was right on the border, and and remnants of a hurricane in 2014 rushed through the washes and hit the wall, and then dragged a part of the wall like a barrier, a quarter mile into Mexico. And and they they showed me that as part of it. So this this part of the wall was just being eaten by Mother Earth. You could see it, but the soil was on top of it. There was purple flowers growing on it. There was spiders, arachnids of all sorts on it. And I'm like, wow, left alone, this border infrastructure, the billions of dollars would just be eaten by the earth, right? And But at the same time I was looking, I could see the border. They had reconstructed it. I could see a border patrol agent with a green striped vehicle across the border. I saw a new, ex very expensive surveillance tower that had just been erected. They had cameras that could see seven miles away. So I wondered, are we being watched by those cameras or the border patrol agent? And really what we were doing, what they were showing me was the, was the water harvesting project. So they, so there was a wall and, but in, but in front of that, in, in this dry wash, they had put steel cages filled with rocks which are called gabions. And the gabions were meant to slow down the monsoon waters that we get in the, in the summer rains. And so the soil could begin to drink the water again. And so they showed me all that. It was working. The, 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 the native grasses were growing back. The native trees like desert willows were growing back. And then they told me something amazing. They said the water table, and mind you, the projections for climate change in this area, in Northern Mexico and Southern Arizona, is a lot of drought and um and there's a 15 year drought and because of this water har harvesting project the water table in their specific region um went up 30 feet in a place where everything was going down and in, in fact it went up so much that it and ejido to the south was seeing its water levels go up as well and i was and that became that that just got me thinking that's a tale of two walls right the gabions themselves almost look like a carved a carved stone wall, but instead of blockading people or stopping people, 
they were meant to absorb they were like sponges trying to absorb the water and that 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 um that 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 brings me to the idea of choice there's a choice right we are here's there's one choice and at that time when i was doing that 20 billion dollars now 25 billion dollars put to a border and immigration enforcement apparatus there or two countries two people from two countries coming together to solve common a common problem of drought by building a water harvesting project together it's a small a very small example but when i asked one of the founders of the group and the group is called cuenca los ojos um when i asked them what could you do with 20 when i asked her what could you do with 20 billion dollars which was the budget for border immigration she's i didn't even have my recorder on which was dumb they they um because she started talking like for five minutes of what they could do with that money, how far that 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 project could extend, how deep into places that were suffering water scarcity, and um and she finally ended. She said it could be the difference between life and death, and I'll leave it with that. Uh, we have uh, several questions coming in, and I, I encourage others to to uh, continue to submit your your questions in the chat room and. We'll try our best to get to them um, um, with the remaining time. Um, there's a question from Lynn. Um, um, and her question um, is related to um, understanding uh, there, within the field of engineering and science, um, there's this idea that the earth is moving closer to the sun and, and has moved closer over the last thousand of years. Are we very close to a tipping point? Uh, if, if this movement continues, the, it will eventually lead to more climate migration, for example. Are we at that tipping point um, in, our, in our present day? Um, why is this reality never part of that discussion? Uh, good, I mean, I don't, I don't know about that reality. So um, yeah, I don't, if, if so I, yeah if that's if that's truly what's happening it should be a part of the discussion for sure i mean it definitely um, as you mentioned it connects with the the broader issues of of climate change which there are connections being made now between that and and migrant and climate migration and the heating up of the earth is uh very much a part of that um there's a one the ones really the study that came out last year about the human climate niche and it and it showed that um, by if things stay the same by by 2070, 17 percent of of the Earth that's being in, um, inhabited at this moment would be uninhabitable because they'd be become too hot because they um, what they call what do they call it? barely livable hot heat zones. So there's this there's the the idea of the heating up um, part of it is definitely there. Um, I don't, and and if that, and I, and I'm sorry, just to to have to admit my ignorance on the getting closer to the sun part of it. Okay. We have another question. This is uh, actually coming from Kim, actually one of my students, um, and Kim is uh, asking um, that with with the increase of uh, you know this this sort of techno wall technology. Techno tech wall that's that's been built with sensors yeah. and, and tower uh, towers drones and whatnot have you uh, noticed a a uh, decrease of migrants crossing the border has it been successful uh with a you know with the upgrades in the security systems that's always so difficult right because um you can look at well the 1994 operations and you, you really see with that the not only the the walls being built in in different cities um the first versions of them at least or the um the 15 foot versions uh the increase of border patrol agents but this increase in technology right the, the sort of virtual wall and you look at those years in the 90s and the early 2000s you see this increase right and then uh and then by 2000, it was 2008 where you see this considerable, 2006, maybe 2007, where you see a considerable decrease, at least as far as apprehensions are concerned. And that was, that did coincide with um, the George W. Bush plan of SBI net, which is 
what they call the virtual wall at that time, the technology, like building the big Boeing contract that was going to build this virtual wall across as a layer of enforcement across the U.S.-Mexico border, which is eventually canceled. But you do see decreases happening as the enforcement apparatus bolsters. But that the thing is, there's other there's economic recession that's happening. There's jobs that are drying up at the same time. And so it's so while it, it could be one factor for sure, there's many other factors that have to be considered, right? Um, when you talk to Border Patrol, they'll say, well, yeah, of course, it's the, our, the, our enforcement apparatus is leading to, you know, pe- less people coming. Or it's funny because oftentimes CBP will use either way. If there's an increase, they'll say, oh, we need more. But if there's a decrease, it's working. So we need more, right? So it's always, mm-hmm. it's used to be spun to get bu- more and more budgets. What so? But the effect, the definite effect of this increase of of this technological border, is forcing people into further remote areas. That is what we've seen in the last ten five five years, especially as this, you know, the SBI net was canceled, but the virtual wall, technological mm-hmm. wall, there's still so, a lot of money put into it. Um, with all these towers, just south of where I live, there's. Uh, integrative IFTs, they call them integrative fixed towers. There's been over about 50 of them built in the last five years. And at the same time, you hear more and more stories about people going through the mountains instead of the valleys. These are border crossers, people crossing the border, going through more treacherous areas. If you look at people dying crossing the border, they're actually increasing, um, even if apprehensions in some cases have decreased. So you're and that that also shows that people are going into more desolate areas, more dangerous areas. In Arizona, the West Desert, kind of near Yuma, the Camino del de Diablo, the desert, the Devil's Highway um, area, uh, and is becoming a, a route used by a lot of people. And and they and of course that's those areas are so desolate in the hottest parts of the desert, and um. And more and more remains of people are being found uh, year after year in, the, in those places. And so it seems like the enforcement apparatus, what it definitely does is forces people into further desolate areas. And that's what it's designed to do with a deterrent strategy. It's designed to make people, the, the actual desert or the desolate area, wherever you are, be part of the border apparatus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, you brought to mind, I once took um, a colleague and I have taken students into the processing center of migrants in Mexico. And when you walk in immediately to the right, it's all technology. You felt like you were, you know, I've never served in the military. You felt like one of those Hollywood films. The entire room is technologically sort of advanced, monitoring everything. And it was always it, that that image always stayed with it, but that's in keeping with the notion, with some people that what we are experiencing is some sort of invasion, right? Boots on the ground, which is a was a which is a, a phrase that comes out of, um, I believe it's the, the Iraq War, I believe. But it's um, anyway that it brought to mind. Your friend mm-hmm. actually brought this to mind as well. We have a question here from Timothy. Uh, uh, have you done any research or had any encounters with faith communities addressing the climate issues? And what what have you discovered? I have had more encounters with faith communities addressing the border issues. Mm. Um, a lot of faith communities addressing the border issues. Uh, um, more than the climate issues, uh, maybe because... I don't, I'm not, I, maybe just because I've been around more faith communities and, and when they're discussing border issues. And of course, nowadays you can't discuss border issues without climate, right? And uh, and so that's definitely a part, I mean, people are definitely, it's, I should back up. It, it's interesting that when I was writing Storming the Wall um, and, uh, you know, five years ago, let's say six years ago, the the it, the kind of connections between climate and migration and displacement and borders were it wasn't being discussed like it is now it's there's a lot more discussion on it there's a lot more 
Um, uh, there's it's a lot more a lot of more different areas and groups and organizations and communities are are um, are taking up these conversations at least have dealing with climate in this at that single and that honestly that's the angle I look at it. I look at it from I've been looking at it from this angle. I'm not like I the the previous question about the climate science. I mean, I'm not a climate scientist. What I do is go and look at what climate scientists say and and report on that. And but I look at it from this angle and um, it seems that that part of this this angle, the border immigration displacement angle is being taken up more and more. And I would I would it, it's faith communities are no doubt addressing this as well. Um, there is a question from Neil, a good, uh, good colleague uh, of mine. Um, he says, he asks, uh, thank you for this very sobering analysis. Uh, so much public discourse in the U.S. focuses on national sovereignty, threatened by implicitly hostile forces. Describing this in economic terms can yield to a hierarchy that those who have, have those who have, must defend themselves those who have not. How to build international solidarity on human terms is a challenge. Churches like the like to imagine themselves as a resource here seems like less likely daily. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that analysis is spot on. Um, it's uh, yeah, the the unwanted starving immigrants from that assessment just pops off that page. And then since I read that, I, I can't read another assessment, even the more recent ones without seeing those words, maybe not explicitly said, but but there, this idea of, of this, like you, like you say, of a migration as a hostile force, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that seems to be that justification. And then building solidarity, right, is like that example at the end that I was, that I was conveying, you know, the idea, it could be so many things. In this case, it was a binational water harvesting project where people came from both sides of the border to um, to actually defy the border in a lot of ways. Like the border itself says you can't work with this person, right? Um, you're not allowed if, you, if somebody on one side of the border has to cross the border. Well, in this case, they have to drive all the way to uh, Douglas and cross in Agua Prieta and then come all the way. So like what should be one second turns out to be a hundred mile drive. Um, and so like the impediments what it, to solidarity, like you say, are there. Um, but that's definitely what, you know, and to, to, to then again, you know, focus on faith, you know, the faith community and what I've seen with faith communities um, on the border. It's so much about you know uh the idea of busting through borders um the idea of solidarity i worked i worked for a long time uh before um before really do doing journalism with uh organizations like border links and border links we worked with a lot of church groups and faith organizations and we did these cross border delegations and it was always about the solidarity of bringing people across borders. The border is the border itself in a way is, is anti-solidarity, right? Mm -hmm. It's about division. It's about keeping people apart from each other. Mm -hmm. And what I often heard is there's not only is it important, there's a spirituality to, to crossing mm -hmm. these places we're told not to cross, right? Mm -hmm. Or and and coming together and building these these bridges of solidarity. Mm -hmm. Um and honestly that I honestly think that's where you know these bridges of solidarity is where there's the new world a new world with all these existential mm -hmm. challenges like climate change mm -hmm. you know that's where i think the clay of a new world is and could be built from yeah it, you reminded me of uh my class was speaking with uh dylan corbett um the executive director of Hope border institute in el paso this weekend and uh one of the things that struck me from that conversation is that he he really emphasized that the border is the problem. And, mm -hmm. and, and I, I just, I've been pondering on that a little bit um, this week. But anyway, uh, mm -hmm. there's a, a question from Gabriel. Um, you mentioned the climate summit and I, I read, I read that fossil fuel has rarely ever been addressed 
as a leading carbon emission source, especially now that corporate companies like Amazon become increasingly involved in these talks. What do you think the general public can do to address this climate displacement problem locally and globally? Yeah, also I should mention at this point that uh, we, I was a co-author on this um, report that came out a, two, a week ago or two weeks ago, right before the, right before the COP26, uh, called the Global Climate Wall. And what we did was we took the highest emitting um, countries and, and, and we also looked at the highest emitting fossil fuel companies. Um, but the highest emitting com uh, countries um, and then compared them with their border militarization or immigration, border and immigration enforcement budgets. And lo and behold, the highest emitting countries are the ones with the biggest budgets going to border and immigration enforcement. Then we, what we did was compare that against climate finance. Now, climate finance is uh, the money and that rich countries, again, the highest emitting, historic emitting countries, by the way, the United States is 30%. If you go back to 1850, as far as carbon or greenhouse gas emissions, the United States is responsible for 30%. Um, we took the border mili border and immigration budgets and compared them to climate financing. And in 2009, the countries, uh, the rich countries, Annex One countries, as the UN calls them, agreed to, to contribute $100 billion starting in 2020 to the most vulnerable countries in the world facing climate change. And what we found in the report was that there was a woeful neglect over the last 10 years towards these committed goals while border and immigration budgets were rising and rising and rising. So one of the global things that just become so apparent or became apparent with these findings um, among, you know, even when you get past, you know, the highest emitting, having the highest debt, right? And in terms of what, you know, responsibility for what's going on um, is that why, you know, the question, the fundamental question we ask is why all this money going to building a world of walls, world of incarceration of people, when this money could be much better spent going to countries to help them adapt to to um to to whatever the re you know the local circumstances of climate are but also and this is a key point and this is probably one of the, one of the most controversial ones w what we're seeing is migration is going to be forced relocation of people is going to happen no matter what so to like really address this problem instead of putting your money to criminalizing people crossing borders why not assist them? That is a migration is adaptation. It's a part of the adaptation. So you can assist people um, in moving costs, for example. You can uh, you can you could invest in places where people are going to because you hear a lot about oh people are coming to this place and you know there's not enough of this or not enough of that. Well, take buddy money going to border, put it into cities where people are going and create more, build more hospitals or education system or invest in those those places. I mean, the, the possibilities are vast what, what can be done, but the point I think we were making was that there's a neglect to this climate finance or climate action element while border is increasing. So why can't that, why can't you move it to from one place to another? And then finally, like the, the right to stay home and the right, the freedom of movement being both fundamental pillars of, of that. Um, we have t time for one more question, Todd, and I'm going to try to get to it quickly. Um, have you seen over the places uh, along the, uh, let me start from the beginning, CB, CBP's use of prevention through deterrence in Southern Arizona is well documented strategy. Have you seen over place seen over other places along the border where environmental change is used to keep migrants out. Yeah, I think um, that's, in fact, not only along the border, I think that's a, that's a strategy along the 2000 mile border in general, um, though it manifests like what people do manifest in different places. But I see that around the world, right? If you go to the Mexico Guatemala border, for example, and how all the highways have checkpoint galore and people end up walking circumventing those checkpoints going into vulnerable areas or even being forced to go on the tr going on the train which is very dangerous that's just how i think that's the deterrence strategy it's the same thing the environment itself 
puts people in extremely vulnerable places that are very risky and dangerous. And that that's supposed to be a deterrent. Mm -hmm. The Mediterranean Sea is another example of it with Europe and how the fortification around the European Union um, and what people will do is and, and, and the Mediterranean, of course, has been one of the most dangerous uh, border crossings with ships capsizing on a regular basis. Um, I see manifestations of the deterrence strategy everywhere. And I think it's like about like the area, these areas become becoming, you know, an, a part of the border, but it also puts it away from the public eye, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's way far away. The TV cameras are never there. Right. Um, sometimes reporters get out there, but a lot of what happens mm -hmm. It's almost a war that goes unreported, right? It's just out of sight, out of mind. And if it's out of mind, what, like, it's hard to do anything about it. Yeah. Um, we've reached the end of our event. And there's, I, uh, I, there's other questions, and I have other questions. Um, I, I personally want, you know, I want to thank on behalf of everyone here. Um, you know, thank you for the work that you're doing and, and, and continue it in keeping us informed um uh, along these uh, these 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 um situations and and as my role as uh as i play uh theologian in many ways i uh, re reimagine uh how you know christianity and other religions sort of play a role in all of this as well so mm -hmm. you've given us um, a lot of um, good material here to work with so thank you thank you and really if you're ever in arizona or a group of students or anything yep. please okay. look me up and if anybody wants to be in contact um, Francisco has my email, and I'm more than willing to continue this conversation beyond here. Thank you. Thanks. All right.